We thank you for this time that you've given us to come to Awana again, to uh, memorize our verses, to spend time uh, with one another, and to study your word. And Lord, we pray that as we look at uh, Jesus in this uh, passage tonight, that we will uh, see him truly as our, our Lord, um, as our Savior, and that we will trust in him uh, for our, our hope and our salvation. So we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so last week, <laughs> ladies, you need to pay attention. Last week, uh, Mr. Kenton taught on the beginning part of Mark 2. Does anybody remember what happened last week? What happened? Jesus is preaching in this crowd that's uh, really full inside this house, and then what happens? Okay, hang on. Elsie, you're raising your hand. Um, a lame man, basically a man that couldn't walk, yep. he was lowered on a bed by his friends from the roof into um, the house. Okay, exactly. So. The, Okay, to be healed, and then Jesus does heal him, but first Jesus does something else. Uh, Isabella, do you remember? He forgives his sins. He forgives his sins. So even more importantly, he forgives his sins, and the Pharisees are upset because who's really the only one? We can forgive each other's sins, but who's really the only one who can forgive sins? Ellie? God and or Jesus. Yeah, only God can forgive sins, and yeah, Jesus is, is taking on that um, that ability to forgive sins. And then, uh, Elsie, you got something out there? He, he says to the lame man, son your, son, your sins are forgiven. Yes. And then what does he do? He tells the man to get up. And he tells the man to get up, and he takes his, his mattress and goes home. Uh, right? So he heals him, and so but the people still don't get that if God is the only one who can forgive sins, and Jesus can for not only forgive sins, but tell this man to get up and walk, when this guy has you know, maybe never walked before, uh, and, and heals him, that Jesus has the ability to do that. And so one of the words that is used in this passage uh, is this word authority. We're going to talk about what that, that means as we get into our passage tonight. But let's talk about um, what does it mean when you say you have authority to do something? Because it's not exactly the same. Hang on just a second, Elliot. See so you're raising your hand there, which is good. But it's not exactly the same as power. Power is, is connected. Power is the ability to do work or do something. But what does authority mean? Elliot, you know? Thank you. You're welcome. Authority is like, um, like a parent, uh, like your parents, since they are in charge of you. Um, they have authority over you. They tell you what to do and things. They tell you what to do and what not to do. Or like if your teacher is an authority figure because she tell, he or she tells you um, like what school to do and what stuff to do. Okay. And um, yeah, authority means basically like in charge of someone. Okay, in charge. So that's what a lot of this passage is, that we're going to be looking at tonight talks about is who is really in charge. And Jesus is showing that he's in charge. Power is the ability to do something. Authority means that you have the right to do something. Because you could do something that's bad and use power to do it. But it, authority is that you. it is right for you to use that power. It's kind of like you guys know the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Like, knowledge is you can know something. Wisdom is using that knowledge correctly. Authority is using power correctly. Uh, so let's read this passage um, in Mark 2.18. Somebody want to read that first uh, verse there? Did you want to read? Yeah, okay. I have it yet. You're not ready yet? Okay, we'll get you on. on you want me to get you on the next one? Or, or the next couple? Okay, Ellie, do you want to start us off? Mark 2.18. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and, and, the, of, and of the Pharisee, Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Okay. So it says, if you guys are listening, that the, uh, the Pharisees and John's disciple, and what John is that? John the... Baptist. Baptist, yeah. And uh, so he's not a Presbyterian. Uh, so anyway, uh, it says that they're doing something. The Pharisees and John's disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, how come your disciples don't what? 
Fast? Fast, yep. So it's fasting, or the word fast, which, you know, can kind of mean quick or something like that. But in this contest, context, uh, what does, Samuel, what does fasting mean? Not eating. Okay, not eating. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Ellie, you got some? Um, fasting go, uh, means like to go without food for uh, more than one hour. Or um, like sometimes my mom does it, she fasts like for a day or so. Okay, yeah, and it can have those health, uh, there can be that health aspect of fasting. It basically just means going without eating for a period of time, usually just because something more important has come up. So sometimes you may think like, uh, that's actually why we call it, what's the first meal of the day called? Break, breakfast. Breakfast. If you break up that word, it's breaking your fast. It's your, you've been sleeping for you know, a certain amount of hours and you break your fast in the morning. So it just means usually, in the most general way, that you're not eating for a certain purpose. Uh, Tilly? I've got an example. Okay, go ahead. One time, Elsie slept in so long that she woke up at lunchtime. Okay, well there you go. So that's... Then it was, yeah, lunch was technically your breaking of that fast, okay? So that's fasting. Now, they did this for a reason that sometimes uh, they would be so, um, there would be a situation that would be so serious that they just wouldn't eat and they would just focus on prayer and, and talking to the Lord. And so this is uh, why they fasted was because they were uh, repenting over their, their nation's sin and hoping that God would bring them final salvation. Okay, so this is why they fasted. Uh, they were hoping for the kingdom of God to come. And so they're, they're fasting. And they asked Jesus, and his, uh, why, why don't you and your disciples do this? How come you don't fast, have this planned time where you fast and don't eat for uh, two times a week? And, you know, have this time where you're praying for the coming of the kingdom of God and confessing your sins. Okay, so this is an issue that they're, they're bringing up. Uh, the Pharisees also um, start to fast and they start to try to get attention from it. They're like, aren't, see how good we are? See how we do this every, every twice a week and, and how awesome we are for fasting? And they were trying to get other people's attention from it, not really focusing uh, on the Lord. So they asked them, how come your disciples don't fast? Yeah, Samuel. And they're also like, Boasting, basically. Yeah, they're boasting. They're making it about themselves instead of about um, really, you know, being uh, concerned about the kingdom of God and pursuing the Lord. Okay, so we're going to see how Jesus answers them. He answers them in a way that he's going to use kind of an analogy, where he's going to talk about something else to give them kind of, like you said, Tilly, when you said you had an example, that's what Jesus is going to give them. Um, do you want to read verse 19? Mark 2? Uh, yes, please. Yes, so you could read verse 19. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bride, the bridegroom, mm -hmm. is with them as long as they, wait, no, as long as they have the bridegroom. Okay. We're doing fine. Can I start over? You're fine. As long as they have the bridegroom with them. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they come on fast. Okay, good. So it's, Jesus gives an example, an analogy of what is he comparing this? He's talking about some sort of event. Sometimes we do them here at the church where. This lady wears white and walks down the aisle. Juliana? Uh, a, wedding. a wedding. Okay. Now, is a wedding usually a joyful, happy time, exciting, or is it usually like sad, mournful, like kind of, you know, feeling lousy? Uh, Faith, what do you think? Um, happy and surprising. Happy and surprising? Hopefully not too surprising, but yeah, it's, it's fun and... Like, and like Oh, I guess there is a surprise when the pride gets kind of uh, unleashed or revealed. 
yeah. Um, sometimes they are surprising, especially in movies and stuff. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, they're supposed to be happy. And Jesus is saying, so, and when you fasted and you're mourning over your sins and you're, you're confessing your sins before God, that's not really a happy thing. So Jesus is saying, it's like when there's a wedding going on and Jesus is with them, are the disciples happy or sad? Happy. They're happy because Jesus is there with them. Okay, so he says, it's like when the bridegroom, which is like the, uh, it, it's the, the husband um, who, who's going to get married. And you, so there's the bridegroom and the bride. Uh, so that when the husband's there and at this occasion, it's supposed to be joyful. He says, so right now, while the disciples have Jesus with them, they don't need to fast. They don't need to be waiting for the kingdom of God because Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God. Uh, and so let me read um, verse 20. And he says, but... The days will come when the bridegroom, who's that? Who's the bridegroom talking about? Yeah, Isabella? Uh, man who's going to get married. Okay, but who's Jesus referring to? Who's the analogy about in this? So he's saying kind of picture a wedding. The bridegroom's there and then the bridegroom's going to go away. Who's, who's that referring to? Uh, Juliana? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is saying, while I'm here with the disciples, they don't need to fast because I'm bringing in the kingdom of God and they can be happy and joyful. But there's going to be a time where the bridegroom goes away. What's that talking about? Ellie? Um, uh, it's referring, Jesus is referring that to Jesus leaving. Um, or it, what he mean is that referring to? Like, is that... Yeah, when Jesus leaves, when does that happen, that they're going to be sad? Um, Big event in the Gospels. When does Jesus... He's, after the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath is, is part of that. After but, the palm tree thing? Well, yeah, after that, it's the big, big event that's coming, that's uh, this thing that Jesus has to face in the Gospels. Samuel? Dying on the cross. Dying on the cross. Oh, the yeah. crucifixion. Really sad that he died, but then he came and rose again on the third day and was really happy. Right, so they came back. But then Jesus is in heaven now, right? And you guys know, or you should know, ladies, ladies, are you paying attention or are you paying attention? Okay. That Jesus is coming back. That's what we're waiting for. So he says, and in that time, when they're gone, the disciples will fast. Okay? Now he, he points out something else. Okay? He does another analogy. Who wants to read Mark 2? 21, 22. Juliana, you haven't read yet. Let's have you read Mark 2, 21, 22. No one sews a patch of unshrunk clothes on the old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine uh, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, no, they will, no, they pour new wine into new wine skills. Okay. Skin. Okay, good. So Jesus says, look, you don't take a new piece of cloth and sew it onto an old garment, right? And he says, you don't take new wine, which is basically like grape juice, and before it's done being made yet, you don't take that and pour it into an old bottle, basically, an old wine skin. He said, that just wouldn't work. So Jesus is talking about that he's bringing in something new. Remember that... Uh, Jesus, at the beginning of the gospel, in Mark 1, 15, he says, uh, he tells them to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is now um, near. And so he says that you have to be prepared for the coming of the new, which was promised in the, the Old Testament, that Jesus was going to come and bring something new that had not, uh, had not been done before. And that's the, the full... Uh, salvation that they were supposed to be waiting for. But the problem is, are they ready for it or are they going to miss it, you know, when Jesus comes? What do you think, Tilly? Or, um, were you raising your hand about something else or were you raising your hand to answer that? Um, okay, that's all right. If you remember. Maybe Jesus is referring to something, but they don't know about it, so they're going to be really, really shocked when Jesus dies on the cross and Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they're not going to be ready to understand what's happening with Jesus. That's a big part of, of Mark, is that they don't really uh, get it. And so fasting, not eating, it wouldn't be appropriate anymore because the kingdom of God is, is near. Okay, let's look at the, the second part. 
about the Sabbath. So you guys know, let's, let's talk about what that is first. Let's talk about the Sabbath. That's in Exodus. Exodus. Close, Exodus 20, um, when the Ten Commandments, but actually the Sabbath comes earlier than this. When, when does the, uh, what is the Sabbath? What does that mean? Samuel? Was it that big, huge dinner table and they're having that feast um, with Jesus and his disciples? Um, sometimes that is related to a Sabbath, but uh, we'll get a little more specific than that. Isabella than Ellie. Okay, good. So that's what I was referring to. Genesis uh, 1 and 2, God creates the world. And, and how come the week's not just six days long? God creates an extra day to be holy to him for rest and uh, focus on worship of God. Yeah, Ellie? Sabbath is also Sunday. It's referring to Sunday, which is the day of rest. Is what is said. Uh, it is now. It used to be referring to Saturday. Oh. So it's Sunday what became kind of the focus because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So there is a connection to that, but yes, Samuel? It used to be Saturday, and that was also when um, Jesus was um, the Sabbath was getting we in there wondering why, and you said that you should take a break and stuff. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, the Sabbath, now this was very serious. It showed that you were dedicated to the Lord, and we have here... Maybe a big problem because the, the Pharisees are going to accuse Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath, which in the Old Testament, if you broke the Sabbath, ladies, let's put that away. If you broke the Sabbath, what was the penalty? What did the law say would happen to you? Does anybody know? You died. You died. Yeah, they could, they could put you to death for... Uh, for breaking the Sabbath. So this is one of the most serious commands of God that you you rest, you you avoid labor, and that you focus on the worship of God except for a few cases and emergencies and things like that. Oh. Yeah, Tilly, is that what you're going to ask? Yeah, like what if we're sick? Well, that's what, uh, yeah, that's what Jesus is going to focus on because he's going to heal people on the Sabbath and they're going to say, wait a second, isn't that work? And he's going to say, well, should I do good stuff on the Sabbath or bad stuff on the Sabbath? So he's going to bring up those type of points. So here's where one of the first issues where that comes up. So let me read Mark 2, 23 and 24, and you can read along, listen as I read. It says, and it happened as he was passing through grain fields on the Sabbath. So he's walking around with his disciples on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking heads of grain the Pharisees were saying, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Okay, so we may have a really serious problem here because if Jesus and his disciples are not, uh, are, are working on the Sabbath, that means they're not being loyal to God. That means they're breaking the law. That means they're not being loyal to Israel and that they deserve to be uh, put to death. But the Sabbath didn't say you couldn't eat. What, what Jesus and his, his uh, disciples are doing is they're going around preaching about the kingdom of God, right, and healing and doing all this stuff. What they actually did was not against the law. Basically, it did this. So, see, watching what I'm doing? Okay, they went over to a head of, of grain. So, imagine there's a head of grain right here, and they plucked it off and went like this to rub the chaff off the grain, and then they ate it. Yeah. Okay, is that like working and like plowing a field or something like that no so they weren't actually breaking the law but this they are you know this is being taken seriously this does this becomes a very um, serious moment in their ministry so the sabbath is command of the lord that shows that god is in charge of time that he, he can command you to rest on a certain day that he created the week um, that he's lord over history that he owns everything um, and so they didn't technically break the Sabbath, but Jesus is going to, instead of saying, no, I didn't break the Sabbath, and they didn't break the Sabbath either, he's going to point to an Old Testament example of a king who eats bread that was technically, David. what's that? David. David, yeah, he's going to point to David. D-A-V-I-D. Exactly. So David, 
Who was king before David? Does anybody know? Tilly? Saul. Saul? Okay, so, and Saul was trying to do what to David eventually? Yeah, his yeah. he's trying to kill him. And David is running from Saul, and he goes to this priest, and, the pre- and he says, I need bread for me and my men. It's an emergency. I'm on this mission from the Lord. Okay? And the priest takes the, the sacred bread from the altar that's supposed to always be there before the Lord and gives it to David. So it, he, you know, kind of broke the rules. Uh, but the, the point was that what David was doing was more important. Okay? So that's what happened with David, and that's what, what Jesus brings up. Let me read uh, 25 and 26. Read along with me. He says, And he said to them, so Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he, uh, he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. So Jesus is saying, hey, wait a second. You're saying my disciples are doing something wrong and against the law and that's disloyal to God. But have you ever heard of King David? And of course, they know who David is, right? Because David's their, their greatest king in their history. And he said, if David was allowed to do this because David's mission was from God and was so important, then what? Where, where's he going with this? If David's allowed to do it, he's allowed to do it. Yeah, because is Jesus on a mission? No. Yeah, he's on a mission. He's preaching. He's preaching the kingdom of God. He's, uh, he's, he's healing. He's... Um, expelling demons. He's, uh, so he's, he's coming to bring salvation, and he's coming to bring it uh, in, a, in a new way to the, to the world. So he has something that's more important than just whether or not the disciples are picking bread up and eating it, that they are doing something more important. Um, we also need to see a similarity. David, what's, what's David's uh, position? I've said it already. What's he remembered for? He's not a shepherd. He's a what? He's a... David? No. Jeffrey, what position is David? A king. He's a king, okay? What position is Jesus, Ellie? Oh, what posi- um, Jesus. David's a king and Jesus is a? King. Jesus is a king. Yeah, he is, Ellie, were you going to say a carpenter or something? Or? No, I was going to say Jesus is God. He is God, <laughs> but he's also, yeah, he's showing that he is a, a greater uh, version of David, that he's he's the king, uh, the true king. I was also going to say, uh, since you asked what who what David is known for and like what David is, he I was going to say that he's known for slaying the giant. Yep. So, so yeah, and, and in this situation, it, later on he's given uh, David is given this sword, Goliath's sword. So that's you know an important moment as well. So Jesus, we've seen so far, be, first verse. It's called the Son of God. He's, he's called God's beloved Son by God himself from heaven. He's called the Son of Man. And now he's seen as also um, kind of a, a version, greater version of David. Now let me ask you guys this. So God created the Sabbath. God created that day. He, he sanctified it. He made it special for himself and for worship. So who does the Sabbath belong to? Who, who really owns it? Tilly? Yeah. Yeah. But listen to what Jesus says here. Who wants to read? We'll finish up here. Samuel, can you read verses 27 and 28 of chapter 2? And we'll quit here. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Okay. So, yeah, the Sabbath is created, God's gift to humans. Uh, for them to rest and enjoy God and worship God. But it also says what? In verse 28, Jesus says that the Son of Man is what of the Sabbath? Lord. 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 Yeah, so it means that So Jesus is also called Lord of the Sabbath. Which is a position that only belongs really to who? If you're thinking of the Old Testament, Tilly? Uh. Yeah, it only belongs to God. So Jesus is saying he's, he's equal in status to who? God. God. So that's a pretty serious claim. He's saying, I'm in charge of the Sabbath, which means if you were in charge of the Sabbath, 
you're in charge of all time and history and humanity. So it means Jesus is really in charge of everything. Okay, so we're going to uh, quit here and close uh, in prayer, but we're going to uh, go to handbook time. So let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for what it reveals to us and teaches us about, uh, about Jesus. And even though we do not uh, follow the Sabbath, we know that Jesus uh, fulfilled those things and that he is the Lord of, of all those things. Lord, I pray uh, here that he would be the Lord of our lives as well and that we would be followers and disciples of his. Um, and have that, uh, that rest in him. So Lord, we thank you that Jesus possesses uh, all authority in heaven and on earth and that we can trust in him for those things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.